Casey. I'm the Dog Adoptions Manager at Austin Pets Alive. Thanks for being here. So um, the first thing you want to get started with is building up your local government support and talking to um, your city shelter and some pet smarts and other uh, big programs that may support you and give you some off-site space. Th those spaces can sometimes be you know, either PetSmart or Lowe's or just a family friendly area such as a farmer's market, something like that. So just get into your community and, and you'll be surprised with how much support you'll get out of it as well. Um, so also set up your protocols before you begin. That will help th make things a lot more streamlined. If you try to set up protocols while you're kind of going with it, it kind of slows down the process. But set protocols up that you are also willing, willing to build on because you know things change every day. Even at APA, we are updating stuff almost daily, if not weekly. So be willing to adapt and to build up on your programs because that is definitely really important if you want to grow your programs. So also you want to prioritize your needs. So obtain volunteers to help you get your supplies and your manpower as well as helping you pull the dogs that you need to pull. Those, all those things are going to be really important. So you also want to um, plan on which dogs that you are going to pull. So make sure that all your volunteers ahead of time are ready and willing to support you with your plans of your adoption and your programs. So APA started with obviously nothing. We have built up on everything. When I first started, we, had, we didn't have a facility. Um, that was about five years ago now, so we've come a long way. <laughs> um, so we didn't have a facility. We just had an overnight place where the dogs would hang out. So all the dogs there at the facility would go to sites that day. Every dog had to go to site. Then it would, people would come and clean, and then the dogs that were not adopted would come back to that facility at the end of the night and just it was just an overnight sleeping area um, so it was pretty f a fun learning process because some of the behavior dogs that we have now have a facility to stay at during the day versus us you we used to have to make a fortress of x pens and zip ties to make sure that those dogs weren't parading around the neighborhood later in the day so those are all fun things <laughs> Um, when you are selecting dogs, obviously everyone wants to save the ones, you know, the, obviously the last 10% here in Austin are the large dogs with behavior issues. Those obviously don't do great off-site, so all those guys would do best in a foster home situation if you don't have a facility. Um, if you do have a facility, it obviously helps to pull those guys, but off-site adoptions, you don't actually need a facility to start doing those things, so that's pretty cool. Um, diversity is gonna be really important to help pull in different kinds of people as well, you know, the different kinds of dogs, the different kinds of lifestyles those people may have, so they might be looking for something um, particular to fit their lifestyle, and if you're just picking one area of dogs, you're kind of limiting the um, area of adopters that you might have, so diversity is gonna be really important. So benefits of off-site adoptions, we covered you do not need a facility to start off-site adoptions, so that's really awesome. Just a foster-based program um, is all you really need to get started. So the more you're in the community, the more, um, obviously, vision you'll get from different people. When we first, we have downsized our off-sites uh, just a little bit now that we have a stronghold in our facility, but we used to go to sites seven days a week, every week, rain or shine even sometimes. So um, we would go to PetSmart, South Congress and Gibson, all those places every day of the week. People would expect us to be there, so if they were looking around for a dog, they knew we'd be there at that time, that day. We'd also keep our website up to date if things were to change, but in general, we were pretty consistent. We were there every day of the week. So that way, the more adoptions would happen um, and the more animals we could continue to save even if, 
even though we did not have a large area to hold animals. So spread, that also helps spreading your mission in your community. It also gets you out there to help um, with volunteer promotion, adopters, educating them. So all those things are really good to just get you out there in the public um, is really gonna help you. So offsite startup, develop a relationship with your partners and again, have established protocols um, so your adoption processes will be a lot smoother. So selecting sites, when we're shopping around for a site, we scout it out a little bit. We'll kind of maybe drop by a couple days and see how busy the traffic is. Some of our newer sites do take a little bit more time to get busier adoptions there just because you know they're new. People aren't used to us being there consistently just yet. And the ones that we've been at the longest are obviously our strongest sites because we've been there so long, people expect us to be there now. Um, so scout it out. If you're just not getting the right amount of traffic that you need, it might be time to shop around for a different adoption site if you have that option. Um, but really just the consistency of being there is really gonna keep it stronger for adopters to come and also keep your relationship with those partners strong as well. So it does help to make an appointment with the uh, partner management or you know the uh, property management if it's not a store to make sure that you are meeting what they need and they don't have any strange, strange restrictions that are gonna kind of hold you back from the adoptions that you need to do. So all those things are good to plan ahead for before you actually start doing adoptions, but you do wanna have all your supplies ready to go so you can start you know, the next day or even the day of if they are ready to go and they have, they meet all, all your needs for your adoption sites. <clears throat> so supplies for offsite, you really want to, when we first started and we still do depend on our trained offsite counselors to make sure that they have every kind of supply that they would need to function throughout the day. Because we aren't necessarily available to just drive over and bring them stuff later. They are, they are supposed to have all their supplies needed so they can function as an entity for the whole day without any other support. They have all their stuff. So those things will include you know, sanitizing supplies, basic dog care items, dog containment items such as the play pens, kennels, things like that, um, adoption materials, Weather supplies, I'm sure if you haven't been to Austin before, you've kind of seen our whole weather spectrum. The last three days it was nice and warm on Friday, and now it's thinking about getting cold and wet again already on Sunday. So we kind of have to be willing and ready to change even, uh, you know, 10 minutes ahead of time. So got to be on your toes for sure. Um, and of course, marketing materials are really important. Um, our ad adoption counselors make sure that they have their donation jars out first thing, and then that is the last thing that they put away. So while they're there the whole time, that donation jar is out there receiving donations, so that way it has the full amount of time to get what it needs for that day. And it also helps us track that kind of foot traffic at those stores or locations as well. <clears throat> So every adoption site will need donation jars, folding chairs, tables, X pins, um, staff signage. So if you have a pretty busy site, you want to make sure that visitors can identify your counselor quickly to answer any questions. So all those things are going to be helpful. Dog and human first aid kits, tents for sh shade. Um, you can also definitely want to bring some tarps and things like that just for backup. Um, leashes, collars, harnesses extra treats, cleanup supplies, extra everything, even clothes. So bring extra clothes, things happen. This is probably the first day I've been working and not getting peed on before noon, so this is nice. Um, so extra everything's gonna be really important. Um, we also encourage counselors to bring a kit, which is one of those plastic office supply containers, like a mini filing cabinet, so they can put all their supplies in there and you know it's waterproof, so just having that basic kit with them where they can make sure that all of their personal supplies that they need, extra zip ties, clips, all that fun stuff is 
in their kit. <clears throat> so this is kind of a picture of what one of our site setups would look like. So we had um, three tents, plenty of space between each pen that will limit you know, contamination dog to dog, so that's very important. Um, every dog has two bowls, toys, there's pools available, blankets, there's signage on the pen, sanitizing, uh, hand sanitizer in each pen. So the more attractive you can make it, obviously the more attention you'll draw to your site and that's really important for sure. <clears throat> so storage of supplies can be a little tricky. Um, so really right now, all of our vans have enough space in it to keep all of our supplies that we need for each day. So those are, that's what we're using to store our supplies right now. Um, when we didn't have that space in the vans and we were having more dogs go to site, we partnered with PetSmart and other locations for them to give us space at their store to put our, put our stuff. And the PetSmart, PetSmarts have been really welcoming about that as well as Petco and our SoCo location um, property manager allowed us to have a shed. So that definitely helps. So just communicate with them and tell them what you need and a lot of times they'll really pull through for you. So um, just making sure that your stuff is stored safely and securely is gonna just make it last longer and hopefully save you money in the long run if that stuff's taken care of properly. So more supplies needed. I don't know if I could have gone a day without having zip ties. I could probably make an arc out of zip ties and X-Pen right now. Probably wouldn't float, but it would look pretty cool. Um, so bleach, obviously plenty of bleach. Sanitizing sprayers, those bleach sprayers we use those all the time. We make sure all the counselors spray their site down before they use it and then after, after they're packed up. So we make sure that it's extra sanitized. Everything's supposed to be sanitized before they use it and then when they're done using that thing, those things as well. <clears throat> so we use a lot of uh, large storage bins, those plastic containers to sanitize uh, toys and bowls in. Those are really helpful. And you do wanna have some backup plans to break up dog fights if they were to happen. Luckily, those aren't very common, but you still wanna make sure that your staff is prepared for any kind of emergencies. So things like that definitely need to be around, such as shake hands, air corn, citronella spray, something like that, water script bottles are gonna be just good to have around just for peace of mind as well. <clears throat> Basic dog care items, obviously wanna have plenty of water and food bowls. We try to just stick with stainless steel bowls and luckily 90% of ours were donated over a course of time. So if you just plea that out, people will step up and donate those things. Plastic is great to have as well. Um, just the stainless steel ones are just more reliably sanitized. Um, leashes, collars, water. We didn't have, we don't have running water at our South Congress and Gibson site, which is our longest, the longest site we've been at. So luckily we have a staff member that lives down the street that lets us use her hose and fill it up sometimes if it's the summer and we run out of water. Um, but in general, now that we have a facility, all the counselors fill up their water jugs before they go to site. So they have extra everything planned ahead. Clean it bags, food, toys, treats, plenty of blankets and grooming items. Nail clippers are great to have, not just for nails, but they are amazing at clipping zip ties. Way better than scissors, for sure. So dog containment, um, plenty of X pens, zip ties, crates, and secure um, crates and whatnot in your vehicles. But um, I'm see I've seen different rescues use different containment areas for their sites. Some places will use those pop-up kennels. Um, we like to use these X pens to give the dogs plenty of room. Um, we want to make sure that they have plenty of room to stretch out. And some of those puppies, we, they're too young to walk. So the more room we can give them at site, the more exercise they can have. Um, and it's obviously easier to keep them clean and clean up after them if they're not stepping on top of each other. So that all those things help really well. <clears throat> so adoption materials, um, I did just hand out before we started. Uh, there's a basic dog take home packet on each table. Um, except for some of the back tables, so y'all can pass them around a little bit. 
But that is one of our core adoption materials that we use to educate adopters. Um, even adopters that are, that are experienced, we have resources um, in Austin that want to reach out to adopters for support, such as uh, vet clinics that will offer free wellness exams, and there's some trainers that may offer discounts. So we like to have all of our adopters have those resources readily available if you know anything were to come up. So those things do help a lot, and each counselor goes through the packet with each adopter at the time of adoption as well. So adoption packets, we use lots of handouts and addendums for some of our special case adoptions, such as puppies with ringworm or mange, so that way we can disclose all information that is required with that kind of care for that kind of treatment. Um, so we like to disclose as much as possible. That not only protects us, it protects the animals, so the adopters know that they've signed up for that, that, that addendum saying that they're ready and willing to treat ringworm or treat Demodex mange at the time of adoption so they can, can't come back later and say, oh, you never told us this puppy had Demodex mange. Yeah, we did. It's right here. You signed it. So um, we'll make them a copy of that as well at the adoption. <clears throat> so table folding chairs or clipboards, pens, all those good things, donation jars, Plenty of signage and literature are great to have just around the community. If you're not expecting a lot of adoptions or if you're just a new, at a new location, it's great to just have handouts so you can get your name out there. You can get people um, informed with your program, what you're doing, and maybe even recruit some vol volunteers. So plenty of weather-related supplies. Um, we, this last year, we had a very generous donor donate an ice machine, so we had that available um, for our sites this summer, and that was extremely helpful. So sunshades, tents, um, when we didn't have an ice machine before, we just plea out to volunteers, and I think Ready Ice, one of our Austin-based ice companies, donated ice to us. We just had to get a volunteer out there to pick it up and bring it where we needed to go. So all those things really helped us out. Um, obviously, plenty of blankets and jackets and sweaters for cold weather. Here in Austin, we can check the weather nine times, and the day may still turn out differently, so we still like to make sure that the counselors are prepared as possible for anything. And if it is to rain or something like that, we might have a backup site that's indoors or something like that planned to make sure that, that those dogs are taken care of that day. So we do have a lot of checklists. We each day we'll send out a dog list that has which dog's going where, and um, that really does help out a lot. With we send that to our whole foster team, all the counselors get it, the receptionists get it, so everyone's literally on the same page of which dog is where that day, and that has all of our sites that are. That's this only excludes our foster dogs. This is just our sites that day and our um, facilities and which dogs are where. So each day this is placed onto our website and our website already has the foster dogs listed. So this makes sure everybody's in the same place and everything's updated each day. Um, also, all the counselors check for pre preventative medication each day before they take those dogs to site. So that way adopters make, we make sure that those adopters are getting a dog that's readily up to date with everything they need, such as vaccines, preventatives, all that fun stuff. Um, when loading and unloading, the counselors check the vehicles every 10 minutes when the weather's really cold or you know warm to hot. They're expected to check the vehicles every 10 to 15 minutes while there's animals inside and make sure the vehicle stays at a comfortable temperature. So daily offsite schedule, 8 a.m. counselors show up, arrive to APA, and prepare for the day, such as printing off their personal dog list, seeing which foster dogs are coming to site, putting those folders together to make sure they have all their adoption material before they actually do the adoption. Um, about 10 in the morning, the counselors leave for their site after stocking their van of materials that they'll need, as well as all the dogs and medication. 11 a.m. counselors will set up their sites and make sure everything looks nice and fancy. We try to make sure the counselors 
uh, put the signage on the pens before putting the dogs out because you, you def, I'm, if you're here, you know all about puppy tunnel vision and some people just can't see anything else except the puppies. So we try to make sure those, signage, uh, those signages are up first so people can be a little bit more aware of the puppies and not cross-contaminating. Um, 12 o'clock is the latest that each site is set up. That includes feeding, all the pens have blankets, toys, water, all that fun stuff. Evening meal followed by a breakdown. The dogs that can be walked are walked again for the evening. And the counselor's day ends at 9 p.m. after they've sent out the off-site EOD, which is an NWA report that has each adoption, the behavior notes from that day, the medical notes from that day, things, miscellaneous things that happen at site, the donation amounts, you know, mileage for the vehicle, gas amount paid, all that stuff is on the EOD. So the following day and the managers can all be on the same page with each, each day and each day is in writing and recorded somewhere. And we use a Google Drive document for that. <clears throat> Setup sanitation. Um, we talked about putting out the donation jars first and everything is sanitized with bleach water one part, bleach 30 parts water solution. Site set up more sanitation. Um, so we sanitize the X pen, the ground, um, everything, all the hard toys, bowls, things like that are soaked in a plastic container with the bleach water solution for about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, once the materials have been sanitized, we unload the dogs one at a time, make sure that they don't need to go to the bathroom in their pen later. Again, those are only the dogs that are old enough for walks. Um, the donation jars are hung up, signage, oops. Um, donation jars are hung up, sanitizers. Each dog has bedding, toys, water. While the dogs are being fed, the counselor's supervising the public and make sure, making sure people aren't violating dog space while they're eating. So managing your site, we try to encourage counselors to take their dogs out for walks as often as possible. Obviously, within a reasonable distance that they can keep an eye on their site and be pretty close to what's going on. And this is really mainly while things are slow at site and there's not a lot of people to greet. So dogs get walked, the trash is out of sight, so the site visitors have a more pleasant experience. Um, the public is encouraged to interact with the dogs and take them for walks. Um, so those dogs that are old enough for walks, the public that is interested in possibly adopting will take their keys from them and have them walk the dog where we can watch them that they're safely interacting with the dog. We used to take IDs, but it's easier to forget your ID than your keys because you can't get back in your car with, without that. So kind of slows things down a little bit. So we take people's keys, have them walk the dog. That also kind of encourages that volunteer promotion uh, conversation with them and try to get them in for volunteering as well. <clears throat> we also remind volunteers and visitors to sanitize their hands before interact interacting with each puppy. Sometimes when we pull a lot of puppies that may have contagious illnesses, we do have one site that allows us to take those dogs there as long as we have a documented signage all around. So in those cases, we only let people that are seriously in adopting that day hold the puppy to limit uh, contamination. So obviously everyone wants to hold puppies and snuggle and all that fun stuff, but we try to you know, filter those people that are really interested in adopting or just wanting to hold a puppy. Um, so if somebody is interested in taking out a dog, obviously we have the staff person talk to them first. They're not just welcome to take dogs out and wander around with them. That would work out very well. Managing behavior at site. So here is a example of a pen fortress that has been made at site. And I'm in there with a lucky boy. <laughs> um, so we do have to get pretty creative with X pens. And it, also, if you don't have lots and lots of X pens on hand, then you got to get creative with cinder blocks. And you know, sometimes I've used uh, water buckets full of water for weights to hold down pens so they're not 
being pushed around. Puzzle toys are definitely going to help keep those rowdy dogs at bay and keep them more interested in you know, interacting with a toy versus climbing out of the pen. Lids and visual barriers sometimes are needed for dogs that just really like to be spider monkeys and climb out. Um, pen arrangement is going to help too. So if you have two rowdy dogs, you obviously want to try not to put them right next to each other because they're just going to feed off that all day long. So maybe put them at opposite sides of the site that day so they're not feeding off um, each other's energy. And just doing basic obedience training with them, just interacting with them if you have that time or if you have an extra volunteer to take them out, walk them around, you know, work with some training, just sit down, basic stuff, just to keep, keep them busy. And, and that'll probably show adopters what their real personality is like versus being cooped up and bored in a pen. <clears throat> End of the day breakdown, dogs are walked, everything is bleached again, uh, dirty laundry is gathered, spray pen, uh, pens are sprayed, as well as the ground to make sure everything is sanitized really well. Um, and everything's loaded back up into the vehicle or their storage unit in, a, in an organized manner to make sure those supplies last a long period of time. So when we return back to our facility, or um, if you don't have a facility, they can use a shared Google Drive and update notes at home. Um, everything is updated on the EOD. Dogs are walked, counselors clean out the vans, sanitize, everything that they use that day um, is cleaned again. Restock vans for the next day, such as food, more zip ties, because everybody needs more of those. Um, clean blankets, all that fun stuff. And then nightly log, EOD is updated, deposit all donations and adoption fees, and then their day ends at nine. So obviously, there's not a lunch break squeezed into there. You, we have our counselors bring a lunch and just plan ahead and have volunteers, you know, try to recruit some volunteers to come in and give them a, a bathroom break or something like that. So we try to um, encourage counselors to make relationships with volunteers that want to be present for offsite help. Um, and those are pretty high demand because we have our easier dogs at site, puppies and cute things, so of course volunteers want to be there. So even just 10 minutes, we encourage them to just drop by and give that counselor a hand. So this, at this time, we're going to start talking about staff and volunteer training. And again, we're going to save questions for the end, so just write those down and we can touch those at the end of the uh, presentation. So dog handling, um, I don't know if y'all just went through Mike's presentation, but he kind of talked about a large spectrum of shelter dog behavior. So in general, counselors and volunteers are, are required to handle the dogs um, consistently as well as kindly and respectfully at all times. We want to make sure that, one, the dogs are getting consistent behavior handling so they're not confused with their training, and two, the staff and volunteers set are setting a good example for potential adopters that might be wandering around. Um, training should cover loose leash walking, proper usage of equipment, as well as just general basic obedience skills. Make sure that those people are comfortable, um, not only with the dogs, but also educating the adopters on how to interact with the dogs properly. There is an incentive program for staff and volunteers. Uh, staff get a, um, a raise each class that they've completed. So if they've completed level one, they get a raise. And then the level two class, they get a following raise. With volunteers, the more classes that they complete, the more freedoms they have to take out other dogs. And um, the more classes they complete, the more they have to complete certain classes to get to the next class. So the more hours they have, the more opportunities they have to attend other classes. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody. <clears throat> General safety and behavior. Um, you want to train staff and volunteers to safely break up a dog scuffle, um, as well as catching a loose or scared dog. Those are all important things. We want to avoid dog bites. So if you can train them properly to go slow and calmly, those are going to be um, a good learning experience for them and 
you know, less of a liability for y'all as well to make sure that everybody's handling the dogs in a proper way. Um, leash distance required 10 foot distance between other dogs. And sometimes people, if we have dogs that are kind of just jumpy and excited to meet new people, we don't want to just walk those up to unexpected people that may not want to get jumped on. So 10 foot distance between other dogs and people. And then offsite is encouraged to document, you know, all kinds of notes that would be good information for um, potential adopters and the following staff that day that might have that dog at their site. Um, counselors are also responsible for feeding, routine dog care, nail trims, bathing. Uh, the dogs do get fed two to three times a day depending on their uh, recommended diet from our vets. And enrichment materials are encouraged um, for, to, for the counselors to use for each dog to make sure that they're content at sight and they're keeping busy with the dog toys. Basic medical care, uh, the counselors are also trained to give basic preventatives such as heart guard, flea control, basic dewormer, um, some vaccines. So all those things are gone over during our training. This saves medical team limited time and resources to allow counselors to more fully educate adopters. So the more we educate our counselors, the more they have to educate the adopters, so it's kind of a waterfall effect as well. The counselors are trained to identify basic illnesses and perform general wellness checks on the dogs each day, just looking at their teeth, making sure they're eating well, acting normally, all that fun stuff. Um, counselors are required to report any medical concerns to the manager on duty if it seems pretty urgent or to continue monitoring and make a note at the end of the day, and at that time we'll determine if that dog is well enough to go to site the following day or needs to stay back and get checked out by the vets. Customer service is obviously important in any field. So we do have, when we're uh, hiring counselors, we try to make sure that they have a strong uh, customer service background as well as animal care or one of the other and we'll try to build up on that. So if, um, customer service isn't always being met, we do try to um, train them to be more competent and comfortable with the APA materials so they have more confidence to go over um, the adoption packets and, and talk to people about APA. Uh, friendly and helpful staff members and volunteers will increase numbers, adoptions, um, promoting volunteers. So it's just another one of those really important waterfall effects that is needed in any kind of um, adoption entity. Um, so sometimes we will do um, secret shoppers. So some counselors that we've had for a while, their evals are coming up. We'll have some secret shopper volunteers um, visit their sites and ask them a couple questions and make sure that those counselors are meeting the same kind of le level of customer service as they are with the animal care. So the adoption process, our basic adoption process is the adopter must spend at least 30 minutes with the dog. This is different for dogs in foster. The foster dogs have a little, or the fosters have a little bit more of a foot in the door with the um, adoption process with the potential adopters. So we'll, that's a little bit different process. But generally, the dogs that are at site, they're ready to go home that day, just 30 minutes minimum of hanging out with the adopter. At that time, the counselor will also be talking to the potential adopter about their lifestyle and you know what kind of dog they're looking for and what energy level and kind of matchmaking questions like that and try to feel it out and make sure it's a good fit. <clears throat> After that, the adopters, the adopters complete an application. The counselor will review that application and any red flags, which we'll talk about in a minute, will be discussed with the manager on duty if it's Something like um, they didn't know about crate training. We have, there's a page in the take home packet that covers that. So that would be addressed at the time of adoption anyway. Uh, the manager on duty is the only person that can deny an adoption. That makes sure that, you know, there is a second opinion in, with that adoption process as well as protecting the counselor there. We do want to make sure as a manager that we know what's going on at the site. And if we get a complaint about somebody got, was denied for this puppy, we need to know about it so we can 
talk to the potential adopter about what happened and why we don't do adoptions that way, you know, making sure that those counselors have um, backup as well as a second opinion. Not all little things need to be denied. Some people just need to be educated a little bit more strongly. So it's just one of those things when you have a second opinion, you can make a little bit better decision about that. Um, if it is a housing issue, that's obviously not something that we can fix as APA. That's more of an apartment management uh, landlord conversation. So while the applicant's interacting with the dog's counselors, observing and engaging the potential adopter, making sure that they're handling the dog well, and as well as continuing to communicate with them about what their um, future plans are with the dog and how to do training and all that fun stuff. Um, we try to steer the applicant towards the right dog for the lifestyle. Of course, there's so many people that never had a dog before. They want to get a puppy because they want to train it themselves, even though they have zero training experience. So that's when we kind of communicate with them about, here's this take home packet, read it well, we're going to go over it together. Let me know if you, if you have any questions about crate training, but that's really going to be kind of the core um, conversation that you want to have with those kinds of adopters. Some adopters may not be ready, but we can't necessarily say no because they've never had a dog before because they may have, be a really good adopter. They just need, need that chance. For our puppy adoptions, we do have um, a puppy protocol. So for some of our um, very new adopters, we'll have them hang out with an adolescent, older, kind of rowdier puppy. Um, for about 10 minutes and just see how the, they feel about that interaction. So when you're looking at a two-month-old puppy, of course, everyone wants to take that home and they think they're going to get a full night of sleep and that's just not the case. So um, interacting, having them interact with a little bit older dog kind of gets them a little bit better feel about what that puppy is really going to be like and what that interaction is really going to be, be like. So. Um, when you're starting your adoption policies and procedures, you want to determine adoption fees um, and basic adoption protocols such as minimum age, so things like that. Our minimum age of adoption is 18, so and that's just illegal, makes it legal for our contract to be legal in a court of law if we ever needed it. Proof of re residency, we do follow up with each renter us, even if it's just online with that apartment or call the landlord, something like that, because we want to limit our return rates. You know, things that can be fixed and prevented ahead of time, might as well take that step now so we're not adopting out an adult dog later that has to hang out at our shelter in a foster home for six to eight months before it gets adopted again. So we try to be as thorough as possible the first time around. So our basic adoption fee is 160. Some dogs might have a little bit higher adoption fee if their care was more. Um, such as our Parva dogs probably cost about $1,200 just to treat if they were at a regular clinic. So when adopters are kind of hesitant about paying that adoption fee, that's this is the conversation we have with them. Um, so we do a lot of medical care with all of our dogs. It's about $300 for each dog is for basic care. So it's just another conversation we have. We don't, get, we don't get funding from the government, so we do have to make sure that we are making enough money to sustain our interests. Um, some dogs that we've had for a while, we will reduce our adoption fees. I believe Faith brought a stack of um, our, what is the title of that? Okay, dog adoption fee schedule. So some of our dogs that have been there a long period of time or you know, pit bull puppies that might sit there for four months for no reason other than they're a pit bull um, will maybe drop their fee down a little bit. Or dogs with mange that may not be the prettiest, but they're great dogs, you know, their fee will go down a little bit. Um, for our dogs that are not fixed yet, we don't actually transfer ownership officially until those dogs are fixed through our clinic. That is also a contract that we have with the city that we only adopt out fixed animals. So we do tell those adopters that we are medically responsible for those dogs at our clinic until the surgery is totally done with APA. 
if they were to go to their personal vet between that time, that's totally fine, but we will not reimburse them for that. So that's all on our adoption contract that they sign at the time of adoption to make sure that everything is disclosed, that they know what our plans are for the continued care. <clears throat> so common red flags, and I'm sure this will vary depending on which area you live in and what kind of adopters that you have, but in general, we don't allow outdoor dog adoptions. My train of thinking in that case is we might as well keep the dog because you're going to get out of the fence or you know end up at a shelter again. So it's just safer to educate the adopters as much as possible to make sure that those dogs are safely contained inside when nobody's home. They're getting the right interaction daily. They're getting the right socializing daily. And those are just not things that regularly happen with an outdoor animal necessarily. If they have a history of surrendering pets to shelters, they have current breeding activities, obviously that needs to be a serious conversation with them and make sure that they are meeting all those needs for the other animals that they have already. History of pets dying or becoming lost. Adoption as a gift, obviously we never do gift adoptions. Those don't turn out well ever. <laughs> we have not have good luck with that. Um, Faith even recently received a puppy through our past program that had been given to somebody as a Valentine's Day gift on her doorstep. And she called us like two days later saying, no thanks. <laughs> yes, it was lovely. She was really cute. But yeah, it doesn't work out even if it's a little squishy puppy. That's just a lot to put on somebody's plate. So um, we do have a gift certificate, though. So if somebody in their family is like really, you know, they maybe just lost their pet and they really are going to get another dog in the future, but they're just not ready yet and they don't live with that family member, then they can purchase a gift certificate to give to them and they can come adopt that dog when they're ready. And also, you know, pick out their own dog and make sure it's a good match. So all those things still happen. We just don't give puppies, or we don't do adoption for people that aren't actually going to be taking care of the dog themselves. Um, if there's a desire to adopt multiple dogs at once, these red flags aren't necessarily a no, but they are going to, there is going to be a pretty thorough conversation had with these kinds of adopters. So if they do want to adopt multiple dogs at once, we talk about how difficult that is. Are they going to do training? Are they going to do socializing? All those things, there's a very long conversation had to make sure that they're totally prepared and ready. We don't necessarily do these, but in special circumstances, if those dogs are a good match, we know that those dogs get along really well, and that adopter's willing and ready to take on two dog training processes at the same time, why not? Um, if the adopter's under, under 21 years of age or su supported by their parents, so we do get a number of college students here that are wanting to adopt or they still live with their parents, all that's fine. We still make sure that they um, meet their uh, landlord needs as well. And of course, history of physical reprimands. Denying adoption, we kind of talked about that. That has to go through the manager on duty as well as be a reasonable reason. After approval, we go through all the packet and adoption pro, uh, protocols, such as all the addendums for heartworm treatment, ringworm, anything that might uh, apply to that dog's adoption. Um, we talked about the basic take-home instructions, but these are the other things that we go through at each adoption, the application, medical and behavior history, adoption contract, and then take-home instruction. That's the order we go through it in as well, so they get all that medical and behavior history before they actually sign the contract. <clears throat> um, contract addendums, again, disclose everything. The more you disclose, the safer your um, adoption process is going to be in the future. And it, we also encourage counselors to make every little note on the contract so that can be used in court if it ever came up. We do. Um, take our dogs back, that we just require an appointment made first. And we do offer a lot of resources for adopters to, um, such as if they need different housing. We, we have, I think, a list on our website that has different housing. I think Lovable has a list on their website that 
offers different kinds of housing for bully breeds. Um, so we try to encourage them to look in other directions to try to keep the dog, but if they, that's just not an option, we will take them back. An appointment just needs to be made so we can continue to save other dogs. So and this is kind of just emergency situations at site, pretty self-explanatory, plan ahead for bad weather, um, call your volunteers in MOD if there was an emergency such as a bite or loose dog or scary people that happens sometimes, you know, so not everybody wants to be told no, so you might need a backup person. So just keep your manager in the loop and make sure that your counselors are trained and given, um, sometimes we've had a phone tree before with volunteers that live close to certain sites, so if there was an emergency, they can call certain volunteers for help. Um, and sick dogs, obviously, will call the clinic and the manager on duty, make sure if that dog does need to come to back to our vet or not. So loose escape dog, try to keep them close to you in sight. The counselor can never leave their site unattended. Then they'll have five loose dogs and that's not gonna do anybody any favor. So they have to stay at their site. If they have a volunteer, um, that volunteer can hang out at the site while the counselor tries to go get the other dog, but in general, they're not allowed to leave their site. Um, dog scuffles, we encourage the staff to, they do go through training, but um, everybody needs to stay calm. If there is a lot going on, um, try to back the potential adopters away so people aren't getting their hands in that don't necessarily know what they're doing. So avoiding bites as much as possible is going to keep people safe and the dogs more safe as well. Bites are always a learning experience. They tell us something that, you know, either the dog was uncomfortable with or, you know, maybe a person just went too fast. So those things do need to be noted and disclosed to those dog's adopters. But in general, it's really important to take notes on all those kinds of things. So there is always going to be roadblocks, but it's really important to take each roadblock as a learning experience. That's really the only way to continue to be strong and grow a strong program. So just continue to keep an open mind, have supportive people around you. If something is a huge roadblock or a consistent roadblock, send, you know, have a meeting with your uh, co-workers and supporters and say, hey, how can we fix this? What can we do better? And those things are going to make your programs a lot stronger. So does anyone have any questions about anything?